on today's episode, the 2022 NHL draft is now just a couple of hours away. Will the Chicago Blackhawks trade star forward Alex DeBrinkett to get back into the first round? Then I'll get into Kyle Davidson's conversation with the media up in Montreal, where he discussed the future of the Blackhawks goaltender position. And then to wrap things up will be Jude Jarkera's 2021-2022 season recap segment. All that and plenty more right here on Locked On Blackhawks. Your Locked On Blackhawks, your daily podcast on the Chicago Blackhawks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome in to the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, your daily podcast on the Chicago Blackhawks. Today is Thursday, July 7th. I'm your host, Jack Bushman. You can find me out on Twitter at Jack Bushman 2 or you could also go and check out my Strictly Blackhawks account at Talkin' Hockey for all the latest Blackhawks news and updates. And if you're listening to the audio version of today's podcast and you like what you're hearing, then please be sure to go and show some support first by following the podcast, which will only take a quick couple of seconds, literally just a quick click of the button will help me out tremendously. Be sure to go and leave the show five stars if you like what you're hearing today as well. And if you're tuning in through Apple Podcasts or through Spotify, then definitely feel free to go and leave me a review as well, because I always greatly appreciate getting some feedback from my tremendous listeners out there. And best of all, it's 100% for free wherever you may be listening to your podcast, whether that be through Apple Podcasts, Odyssey, Spotify, Google Podcasts, etc. It's all 100% for free. And if you go and follow the show right now, then you'll be able to get the latest episode as soon as it comes out each day. And if you're not already watching the video version of today's episode, then be sure to go and check out Lockdown Blackhawks on YouTube, folks, because each and every episode throughout the rest of the summer into training camp later this fall, it's going to have a video attached to it as well. So if you haven't done so yet, please, please, please go and subscribe to Lockdown Blackhawks on YouTube. I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. Be sure to go and smash the like button down below for me as well and comment as to whether or not you think the Blackhawks should trade forward Alex Dabrinkit later on this afternoon to get back into the first round of the 2022 NHL draft. And last, ring the bell, go and turn on those push notifications so that way you can get notified when the episode gets uploaded to YouTube each and every day. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining me on another episode of Lockdown Blackhawks, your one-stop shop for all things Chicago Blackhawks. And thank you all for making the show your first listen here to start off your day. To open things up on the show this morning, folks, obviously for us Blackhawks fans, it's a pretty chaotic world right now. We're hearing Alex Dabrinkit rumors. Obviously, the NHL draft is coming up. There's stuff on Dylan Strome and Dominic Kubalik. Kyle Davidson is talking about the future of the goaltender position. We had the schedule come out. I still have to get into my last two season recap segments of the summer. My last one, by the way, for those of you who don't know, is going to be a fun one. It's going to be Blackhawks top prospect Lucas Reichel. I know he only played in 11 NHL games with the Blackhawks this season, but I'm going to take all his stats from his first season in North America from both Rockford and Chicago to kind of give him a, a grade for his rookie season over here uh, since coming across coming across the pond. Uh, but there's a lot going on in the world of the Chicago Blackhawks right now. Uh, but most importantly, the 2022 NHL draft, folks, is set to kick off later on this evening. And why this is so important to the Blackhawks, even if they don't currently have a first round pick, is it seems like they're really trying to get one. And the best way to do that, undoubtedly, would be by trading forward Alex DeBrinkin, two time 40 goal scorer. Before the age of 25, he has one year left on his contract. It expires at the end of next season, and then he'll need a $9 million qualifying offer at least for his next deal. So because of all of that, DeBrinkett has been heavily involved in rumors for the past couple of weeks now. And with the NHL draft looming and the Blackhawks 
probably wanting to get one of those top picks in this year's draft, even though it is a little bit of a weaker draft, I think the Blackhawks would have some comfort knowing exactly where they are picking rather than trading to bring it for a 2023 first and a 2024 first. Maybe there's some unprotecteds in there. And also, even if the team they trade with winds up being the worst team in the league, that doesn't guarantee that they're going to win the lottery. So I think the Blackhawks personally, Kyle Davidson in that front office, would like knowing exactly where they're going to be picking for at least one of the first round picks that they would net for Alex to bring it. And that's why I think it's so crucial that if a deal is going to get done, it is going to happen tonight. I think that's the way it has to be for the Chicago Blackhawks. And based on how we've seen Kyle Davidson handle this situation so far, uh, I mentioned this in my crossover episode with Trey Matthews from Locked On Devils. For those of you who haven't checked that out yet, be sure to go and do so. It was a really good episode. We threw some trade offers back and forth. Uh, lots of good stuff there. And New Jersey is one of the teams rumored to be right there in the mix to acquire Debrinket, uh, according to Frank Saravalli, who posted a posted an episode yesterday, a clip talking about Debrinket. He mentioned that he believes four teams are kind of gearing up to make big pushes for Alex Debrinket. Uh, and we heard that the Philadelphia Flyers are probably out since the fifth overall pick is off of the table. So I'd have to imagine New Jersey is one of those teams. Seattle is probably in there as well. Maybe Ottawa as a little bit of a surprise. Um, but those, those probably to me are the teams most likely to go and put together a package to land Debrinket later on this afternoon. And Debrinket remains the number one player available on Sarah Valley's board. And I, I think it remains that way because of this pressure situation that the Blackhawks are finding themselves in right now. Not, not necessarily the Blackhawks are finding themselves in, but it's kind of, hey, if we want to trade Alex Debrinket, this seems like it would be the best time to do so. Now they could wait until the trade deadline later on this season and who knows whether his stock is going to continue to go up or go down. But um, I feel like getting a high pick in this year's draft is uh, pretty key to Kyle Davidson. He even kind of mentioned that in his uh, chat with the Blackhawks media up in Montreal. I'll get into more of that in just a second and some of the other topics that Davidson touched on. Uh, but basically he said they're taking calls. Um, they're kind of seeing where they're at. The phones are busy, but it's not like anything's set in place at this time. Kyle Davidson kind of said they aren't there at this point. So we'll see if things transition in the next couple of hours. Uh, but that feels like the way it's probably going to go. Um, if Alex DeBrinkin is going to get dealt, it's probably going to come here in the next couple hours. And this is one of those days, folks, where I'm like scared to even jump on the podcast and not be looking at my phone for more than five minutes because news can break just like that on a day like today. So make sure to keep those peepers peeled because there is going to be a lot of news about Alex Dabrinkit swirling before the NHL draft uh, gets underway a little bit later on this afternoon. Uh, but one thing in particular I wanted to add to regarding Dabrinkit's situation is that, again, the Blackhawks do not have to trade him. I get that this is probably the right time and with the direction the franchise is heading, taking four or five, maybe more years. Debrinket's going to be closing in on 30 at this point. You're going to be paying him a premium to be playing for a really bad team. I get it, but again, it doesn't have to happen, and Kyle Davidson knows that's in his favor. And we've heard rumors of three first-round picks being the offer. And listen, that's even to me, that seems like a little bit high, but I get where Kyle Davidson's coming from, like, don't trade Alex to bring it if it isn't for an absolute bag. I think that's the best way to go about it. A hundred percent. I mean, get a Brandon Hagel type deal again, get better than that, obviously with to bring it being the more elite uh, point producer and goal scorer, obviously. But I think that's the type of deal it's going to take for Kyle Davidson to move him. He has to get wowed. And I like that position. I like that mindset. It gives me a little bit of comfort knowing that, hey, if Alex Dabrinkit is traded, which would 100% break my heart, uh, it's probably going to be for a very hefty return. It seems like that's the situation that Kyle Davidson has put himself in. It's a win-win almost. I know it doesn't seem like a win-win because a lot of us Blackhawks fans have become real close to Alex Dabrinkit over the years, and he's our pride and joy and our young playmaker, young superstar that's coming up right now. Uh, but it feels like a win-win because either the Blackhawks are going to trade Alex to bring it for a hefty return or 
they're going to keep him. And if at the end of the day, if Alex DeBrinker remains a, a member of the Chicago Blackhawks, that's a pretty good worst case scenario. And I, I believe that Kyle Davidson understands where he's at and realizes that his back isn't against the wall. It's something I've touched on a lot. He's not backed into a corner and has to get a deal done. And I really believe he rec- recognizes that. He's confident in his situation. Sure, he wants to get back in the first round. He'd prefer to get back in the first round. He even said that himself, but he's not going to absolutely force it. And I think for us Blackhawks fans, we should find that at least a little bit comforting when we're talking about a two-time 40 goal scorer and Alex Dabrinkit potentially being no longer a member of this team. So it's going to be a crazy day, folks. I'm still checking my phone every minute to see if I have any updates, but we've heard Frank Saravalli say it's a matter of when, not if, for Alex Dabrinkit to get traded. I just saw Emily Kaplan saying she believes Alex Dabrinkit is going to get traded today. Uh, Dabrinkit remains number one on Saravalli's trade targets list. We've heard Pierre Lebrun say uh, that he is still very available, but it will probably take a a high first-round pick in this year's draft to get the deal done. So those are kind of all the things that are making up the situation for Blackhawks forward Alex Dabrinkit right now. And I guess we're just going to have to wait and see if he is still a member of this team by the end of the day. All right, I think that takes care of everything I wanted to discuss. Before the first round of the NHL draft tonight, coming up in just a moment, I will get into Kyle Davidson's comments regarding the future of the Blackhawks goaltender position. But first, I need to talk to you all about Bet Online. It's that time of the year again, folks, as baseball season is finally taken over for the summer, and Bet Online has way more odds and info from game scores, totals, player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land. Bet Online remains the number one spot for all sports betting here in 2022. And it's not just baseball, from golf, esports, boxing, and UFC, right to your favorite Vegas casino games. Do not wait to take advantage of all the amazing offers available from the 2020 for the 2022 season bet online is both the fastest and the easiest way to bet on all your favorite sports and vegas casino games bet online where the game begins all right we're back here on lockdown blackhawks moving on into segment two today or actually real quick before i get into segment two i need to talk to you all about what is coming up on the lockdown podcast network with the nhl draft just being a few hours away that's right folks the nhl draft is right around the corner and our team of local hosts here at the lockdown podcast network along with some draft experts are going to be breaking it all down with insights and analysis for every first round pick. And I know the Blackhawks don't have a first round pick right now, but if they manage to acquire one sometime this afternoon, then be sure to join me for 15 minutes after the Blackhawks selection for immediate for an immediate reaction to all the Blackhawks moves. And be sure to subscribe to Lockdown Blackhawks on YouTube for all the latest breakdowns and live reactions on the NHL draft and more. And if the Blackhawks don't end up picking in the first round, I will be going over each and every pick that they make throughout the rest of the draft on Lockdown Blackhawks on YouTube. So be sure to go and subscribe to Lockdown Blackhawks on YouTube. All right, enough of that. Moving on into segment two here this morning. I also wanted to be sure to get into general manager Kyle Davidson's conversation that he had with the media up in Montreal yesterday. And I already spoke a little bit about how, obviously, the topic of conversation was Alex DeBrinkett and the trades before uh, the first round gets started later on this afternoon. And I said, you know, Davidson... Mentioned he's taking calls, the phones are active, he's checking it out, uh, but nothing per se is really set in place at this point. We'll see if it gets there, and we know that Davidson would like to get back into the first round, uh, but it doesn't seem like anything has truly materialized up to this point. But of course, that could all change rapidly here in the next couple hours. But the other thing I wanted to discuss that Kyle Davidson touched on was the Blackhawks goaltender situation, because Davidson mentioned that within the next 24 to 48 hours and he had this conversation with the media uh yesterday afternoon he said within the next 24 to 48 hours the organization is going to have a much better idea of what the goaltender position is going to look like for next season now of course the only two goaltenders that the Blackhawks have signed on in their system right now are 
Arvid Soderblom and Jackson Stavner, who signed a few months back out of Providence College. Uh, neither of them, though, are ready to be NHL starters come next season, especially Stavner. He's got to be down in Rockford for at least one season, you would have to think. Uh, and for Soderblom, he might be ready to take on the backup role next season, but the Blackhawks certainly don't want to be rushing him into the mix as a young young man, young goaltender. He's really just kind of finding his game, still extremely young, and he probably wouldn't have expected himself to be playing in the NHL last season. It just so, kind of uh, happened that way due to injury. Uh, but I know the Blackhawks, they want to be patient with Arvid Soderblom. They don't want to force anything, and they don't want him to be the starter come opening night next season. So that leaves Kevin Lankin and Colin Delia currently unrestricted free agents, although Delia seems very more so unlikely to re-sign with the Hawks than Kevin Lankin does. Uh, but for Lanks, this was a conversation that I had on Twitter yesterday. Obviously, uh, the Blackhawks could want him back. We don't really know where they're at in that process right now. Uh, it was certainly a disappointing season for Kevin Lankin. And after a, a really breakout first half to his rookie campaign, he struggled for the Blackhawks this past season. And when given the keys after Marc-Andre Fleury was traded to the Minnesota Wild, Lankin just did not respond well, did not look like a starter at the NHL level. And maybe that left the Blackhawks with a bad taste in their mouth and they just want to cut their ties right now and go in a different direction. That certainly is on the table. But if they do want to bring Kevin Lankin back, one thing to consider is that Lankinen is a UFA himself. And while he's probably not going to get a better offer than uh, the starters role in Chicago, I don't envision him being a starter really anywhere else in the NHL next season, unless it's due to injury. Uh, Chicago is certainly going to give him the best offer for his own career and give him, and probably give him an opportunity to gamble on himself, maybe take a one or two year deal for low money and then hit free agency again and hope to cash in. It just seems like Chicago would be the best situation for Kevin Lankin to continue his NHL career and try to convince others across the league that he is a starter and has was it what it takes to be a number one in this league. But at the same time, you never know what he wants to do too. Maybe he wants to go into a different direction. Maybe he's okay with being a backup for a winning team. So there are a lot of pieces. Kevin Lankin and the Blackhawks have to be on the same page in order to get a deal done within the next couple of the weeks. But I really don't think that's at all what Kyle Davidson was referring to when he said, we'll have a better idea in the next 24 to 48 hours. I feel like there could be a trade coming, not just the Alex DeBrinca trade. There could be more trades coming for the Blackhawks throughout this NHL draft. And there are a couple of goaltenders out there on the market who are probably a little bit overpaid at this point. And given the Blackhawks situation, they're not all that concerned about wins and losses. They're not going to be, uh, I mean, they could be pushed up against the cap considering Duncan Keith's recapture penalty penalty could hit, but moving forward in the future, cap space isn't going to be uh, too much of a threat for the Chicago Blackhawks. So one player in particular, who's been rumored to be available in the goaltender market and the Blackhawks have even had some links to this team is the Toronto Maple Leafs and Peter Morazic. He's probably been the most notable goaltender in the trade market leading up to the past couple of weeks. Uh, and for the Blackhawks, it's kind of funny because if you all remember, Kyle Davidson and Kyle Dubas had that um, kind of weird back and forth, that weird situation back at the deadline where some news leaked on Davidson's end. Uh, Dubas thought... Uh, it was just kind of funny to see it all go that way. But now these two teams could be linked together in trade talks once again. Uh, ooh, I got some Twitter updates, folks. Okay, nothing too big. Nothing too big. Just some notifications. I was I was scared. I looked at my phone. I had six notifications. I was like, oh, man, did Alex Dabrinka really just get dealt? Um, but no, back to Peter Morazic. He is probably um, – the number one goaltender on on the trade list right now across the NHL. It's no secret that the Toronto Maple Leafs are trying to get him out of there. Uh, I'm about to look up his exact cap hit right now. I should have had that pulled up a moment ago. I apologize for that, folks. Um, but Peter Morazic has two years left at $3.8 million. And listen, Blackhawks need someone to be their starter in goal next year. And if they don't want it to be Kevin Lankinen, and trading for Peter Morazic, maybe acquiring an asset or two, a third, fourth round pick from 
Toronto in order to take on that $3.8 million AAV over the next two years? I, I definitely think that's in the cards for the Blackhawks. And I think that is what Kyle Davidson is referring to here. I really do believe he feels he can get a deal done with either Peter Morazic or maybe another guy like Matt Murray in Ottawa, who I, I still can't believe the Senators signed to that contract. I mean, they knew what they were doing. You took a huge gamble on Matt Murray, who hadn't been good since winning the Stanley Cup. And what do you know? He's still bad. So I don't feel bad for Ottawa at all on that front. Everyone knew it was a bonehead, boneheaded move. But hey, if we can acquire some assets to take on their bad contract, I'm all for it. Uh, but that's definitely what I think Kyle Davidson is referring to when he says he'll get a better idea of what the goaltender position is going to look like within the next 24 to 48 hours. Because it sounds like they're either going to try and acquire Morazic or maybe Matt Murray or a lower level contract. I think those two are probably the most likely though. And if not, then they'll probably try to go in a direction with Kevin Lankin and coming back as the starter. Uh, but that's a couple other things to keep an eye out for when the NHL draft st starts later on this evening. It's probably, that's a trade that probably won't be happening on day one, more so day two. But another thing to keep an eye on is uh, a Blackhawks fan in the next couple of days. One other thing I wanted to mention real quick, folks, before wrapping up segment two is the Blackhawks released their official regular season schedule for 2022-2023 yesterday. And I wanted to talk about a couple of um, key dates that stood out to me. First, the Blackhawks are going to be having their season opener on October 12th against the Colorado Avalanche, which is going to be so fun. We opened the season against the Avalanche last year, got throttled, and now we get to go and see them hoist their banner and probably light us up like a Christmas tree on opening night all over again. And the Blackhawks actually have a pretty tough start to the season. They got Colorado and then back to back with Vegas, a three game road trip to start ending out in San Jose. So kind of a tough way to kick off the year for the Blackhawks, the defending Stanley cup champion Colorado avalanche to open up a three game road trip out West. Uh, but the Blackhawks fun. They'll be having their, uh, home opener at the United Center on October 21st against the Detroit Red Wings, a Friday night game at the UC Blackhawks, Red Wings. I already know I'm going to be deleting beers that night. It's going to be a good one. Hopefully I'll be in attendance. Uh, hopefully we'll get the guys from lockdown Red Wings in attendance for that one too, because that will be a real fun uh, season opener for the Blackhawks, but some other games I wanted to talk about too, after that three game road trip to start the year, the Blackhawks play, uh, looks like six, what is that? Two, four, four, seven of their next nine games will come at home. Seven of eight actually will come at home. So tough way to open up, but then there'll be regulars at the UC for a couple of weeks there. Um, important dates like holidays as well. Uh, Thanksgiving this year, folks, for those of you who don't know, is Thursday, November 24th. And the Blackhawks have games sandwiched around Thanksgiving. They'll be playing the Dallas Stars on Wednesday, the 23rd, Black Wednesday. Um, oh, boy. that I'm going to be deleting beers on that night, too. Black Wednesday, the Blackhawks are playing the Dallas Stars at 730 on the road. They'll have Thanksgiving off, as usual. But then they'll be right back in action on Friday afternoon, a good old 1 p.m. Central Time puck drop on Black Friday. I know everyone's going to be nice and tired for that 1 p.m. start. Um Looking at some road trips here, the Blackhawks have a Eastern Co East Coast road trip, I should say. At the beginning of December, they'll be in New York and New Jersey. Uh, uh, the, their biggest homestand of the year, by the way, comes in early January. It starts right after New Year's Eve, actually. Uh, and the Blackhawks will be playing on New Year's Eve. They're not playing on Christmas. They're not playing on Christmas Eve. The NHL always gives those days off. They will be playing on the 23rd, though. That'll be their last game before the Christmas break. Uh, they'll then have three road games, one in Carolina, one in St. Louis. And then on New Year's Eve, they will be playing the Columbus Blue Jackets, a slated six o'clock central time puck drop. Uh, that'll be on New Year's Eve. So that'll give us all something to something to drink some booze to. And then New Year's Day, the Blackhawks will have a back-to-back. -back. They'll be playing at six o'clock once again, back at the United Center against the San Jose Sharks. And that kicks off a seven-game homestand at the beginning of January for the Blackhawks. They'll be home from January 1st to January 18th. So nearly three weeks they'll be spending in Chicago. Uh, but after that, they, they do start to pick up things on the road a little bit more. Um, but all in all, March is, March is a pretty big month on the road for the Hawks. My birthday, they're playing the Tampa Bay Lightning. Love that. 
They open their season in Colorado, and then on my birthday, they play Tampa Bay. Lovely. Uh, but the Blackhawks, the season is slated to finish up in April. They'll be playing seven games in the month of April. Two of the final three will be coming at the UC with the last. The 13th, once again, against the Flyers, that will be played at home as well. That will officially wrap up the season. Uh, but those are kind of some key dates, some key road trips, uh, the home opener, the season opener, holiday dates that I wanted to be sure to uh, mention to all you listeners out there because I know there are some dates if folks are, are going to have on their calendars, they're going to be doing different things. You can plan ahead now because the Blackhawks got their schedule out in the open. So uh, the season's going to be officially kicking off on October 12th. And what a fun one that'll be, I'm sure, against the defending Stanley Cup champion, Colorado Avalanche. Uh, but wins and losses, not going to be all that important for the Blackhawks this season. We already know that. It's about developing the younger players and hopefully throughout the course of the way, it'll be fun to see some of these young guys step on the scene and uh, make an impact and hopefully cement themselves as key pieces of this rebuild uh, and help this team out as they go through the entire process. All right, folks, I think that is going to take care of all the chatter coming out of Montreal between Kyle Davidson and the media and also the Blackhawks schedule for this season. Coming up in just a minute, I still have to get into forward Jujar Kara's 2021-2022 season recap segment. But first, I need to talk to you all about Built Bar, which is a protein bar that tastes just like a candy bar. Summer is coming and you're going to need some food for being on the go. Well, Built Bars are the perfect snack to take with you everywhere you go. Throw them into your bags, throw them into your kids' backpacks, and make sure that everyone has a bar to be fueled for their summer adventures. And the best part about Built Bars is that they're both delicious and healthy. So there's no more sacrificing delicious food for health because with Built Bar, you can have both. You can get the best of both worlds. And have you tried Built Bar Puffs yet? Because if not, then you are seriously missing out on one of the best tasting protein bars on the market with flavors like banana cream pie, cinnamon churro, which really tastes like a roasted marshmallow with cinnamon on it. They got birthday cake, which comes with sprinkles, mud pie, which tastes like brownie in a cup. They're all unbelievable flavors, and it's actually hard to believe you're eating something that's good for you. It's hard to believe that all these bars are 150 calories or less and have 17 grams or more of protein, but they do. So go on over to Built.com right now and use our promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your next order. That's Built.com with the exclusive promo code LOCKED15 to get 15% off your next Built Bar order. Welcome back to the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast. I'm your host, Jack Bushman. Getting into segment three now today, before I go and wrap things up, before all the chaos ensues here, uh, I still have to get into Blackhawks forward Jujar Kara's 2021-2022 season recap segment. And for Kara, man, it was really tough. Certainly not the first season that he was hoping to have in Chicago after signing on. Uh, it just ended up being an injury plague season for him where he had a, a couple of scary moments along the way too. The most notable one was when he took that shoulder to the head from New York Rangers defenseman, Jacob Truba, who I will die on a hill is a dirty player. I mean, it, I don't care what Rangers fans have to say. Oh, he's taller than everyone. His shoulder hits people. No, go watch Jacob Truba try to chicken wing everyone he hits. He did it to probably at least what I saw. I'm not even a Rangers fan. Don't even watch them consistently. I saw Jacob Truba throw five to 10 of those hits this season. Don't think he got suspended once. He is an absolute dirty player. I will die on that hill. And if you're a Rangers fan who's all butt hurt right now, uh, I don't want to hear it because this is an illegal hit in the NHL. It's not legal. I don't care what your argument is. And that's basically what Jacob Truba uh, hit Jujar Kara with. It was a blindside hit, a high hit. Kara hit his head on the ice, went unconscious, a super scary moment, had to get stretchered off. And then after that, uh, he actually fought his way back to try to get back on the ice for the Blackhawks, but uh, ended up having to go through back surgery too, man. It was just a really tough year for Jujar Kara, and I feel for him because on a good team, I feel like he is a player that can make a big impact, but mostly the, the majority of the looks that we got of Jujar this year came in uh, the abysmal first couple months of the season where the Blackhawks were actually the worst team I've ever seen in my life. Um, so, 
a guy like that, a third, fourth liner who's good defensively, physical, but doesn't provide a whole lot of offense, when your team as a whole isn't scoring goals, it's kind of hard to appreciate those guys. So I didn't really think we got a very accurate reflection of what kind of player or what kind of role and how meaningful Drew Jarkera can be to a roster. I thought we got a little snippet, but we really didn't get the full picture. And for that, it's kind of hard to accurately grade him and give him a fair judgment of how his season went. So I am going to keep that in mind a little bit for Kara. Uh, but getting into the numbers for Jujar, he played only in 27 of the 82 games for the Blackhawks this season. Again, multiple injuries just kind of derailed his campaign. Uh, but in those 27 games, slim pickings for Jujar offensively. He had three goals and zero assists. No assists for Jujar Kara in 27 games compiled a whopping three points, all goals, obviously. And that's the lowest uh, career lows that he's had across the board since becoming a full-time NHLer. Obviously, it probably wouldn't have been that way had he been healthy for the whole campaign. But when he was healthy, not a whole lot of offensive production and not a lot of chipping in out of Jujar Kara. And again, I will uh, kind of deflect some of that to the bottom six being horrendous when he was healthy earlier on in the season. And no one really was even stepping up. Like earlier on in the season, we thought Patrick Kane was on pace for a bad year. I remember when that was a thing, when it was like, okay, even Patrick Kane's having a bad year here. Uh, so it was bad for everyone. So I'm not just going to blame strictly Jujar, but it was uh, a little disappointing that he wasn't able to help create anything. I mean, zero assists in 27 games. Come on, dude. I feel like you got to try to do that. I mean, I don't know. That's that's definitely a tough look for Jujar to have zero assists, only three points in his 27 games played this season. Uh, in terms of penalty minutes, Jujar had 13 penalty minutes. I believe he did fight once. So I think he only had four minor penalties in those 27 games. And one thing I will say, the defensive side of things, Drew Jarkera, for being as much of a big rig as he is, I mean, he's got no speed in the offense. I mean, it's basically non-existent, but uh, except for when he's parking that big body in front of the net. But overall, defensively, for not being a speedy guy, Drew Jarkera is very responsible, and he knows to be in the right spots. He knows how to back check. He knows how to cover his man, cover his area, get pucks out of the defensive zone. It was actually kind of funny. Uh, I was looking at, again, J Fresh Hockey's cards. Um, if you don't subscribe to J Fresh, I, I really recommend you do so because $5 a month, you can pay for these hockey cards. You get some deeper analytics and some deeper numbers on each and every player in the NHL. So I definitely think it's worth $5 a month. So I was checking out Jujar Kara's uh, player card from J Fresh's site. And Jujar Kara over the past three years has ranked in the 75th percentile in terms of defensive efficiency. So whatever he's doing defensively, it is working. And that was one thing that was noticeable for the Blackhawks this season. When he was on the ice, they weren't giving up a lot of high danger chances, not a lot of uh, opportunities in the slot, not a lot in transition. Like he is a true defensive fourth line grinder. And I don't think we were able to properly appreciate that again, because of how bad the Blackhawks were earlier on in the season, but defensively Drew Jarkera is as responsible as they come. He plays that 200 foot game. He's sturdy along the boards, wins a lot of battles, grinds people off of the puck, uh, so that was probably one of the things that stood out to me the most about Jujar Kara's short performance that he had for the Blackhawks this season. Getting into some of the other numbers, though, real quick, uh, in terms of shooting percentage, 9.4% percentage, 9 out of Jujar this year. Scored three goals on 32 shots on goal. And honestly, 32 shots on goal in 27 games for a guy like Jujar Kara, uh, not all that shabby. Now, maybe he can work on his playmaking a little bit and give his uh, line mates some more opportunities and some more shots on goal. I know there was a lot of fourth liners for the Blackhawks that I've gone over in the past couple of weeks who didn't have a whole lot of success at getting shots off net. Drew Jarkera was one of the few guys who averaged over one a game as a fourth liner. So maybe uh, that's something to keep in mind and maybe hopefully he'll be able to uh, kind of spread the wealth a little bit more than he did this season. Zero assists. Again, not good, Jujar. Not going to get the job done. Uh, in terms of time on ice, this one was a little interesting, too. Kara averaged 13 minutes and 36 seconds of time on ice. He had a role on the penalty kill, and clearly he was trusted upon by uh, both coaches earlier on in the campaign. 13 minutes and 36 seconds of time on ice is actually the highest 
that Drew Jarkera has averaged throughout his NHL career. So a little bit bigger of a role. It wasn't like a huge jump up or anything. It was the difference between a minute, minute and a half maybe. Uh, but that kind of shows you, I think, how trusted Drew Jarkera was in a defensive role and also on the penalty kill. And if he's able to get back to full health this season, like everyone expects, uh, then he still, I know the Blackhawks aren't going to be very good, but uh, those are things, you know, being a penalty killer, being a fourth line grinder, those are jobs that people are still going to have to do. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if Kara continues on that same pace in terms of time on ice, if he is going to return with the Blackhawks next season. In terms of uh, face-off win percentage, Kara actually won 52.5% of his draws this year. Now he only took 101 face-offs in those 27 games, so uh, a little less than four per game. He wasn't predominantly used at the center position, but he did show that he was capable of going in there and winning a draw consistently, and uh, the Blackhawks could use a little bit more of that. They could use playing with the puck more often, and uh, Jujar Kara, I don't know if he's going to be strictly a center for the Blackhawks in the future. That might be a little bit of a reach, uh, but he is one of those guys where you could comfortably throw him out there on the wing. And if your center gets kicked out of the dot, you still have faith that he can go in there and win a draw. And you need those guys in the bottom six. You need those guys to have success at the NHL level. In terms of hits, Kara was on a rampage last season. In 27 games, he had 88 hits, which was on pace to absolutely shatter his career high. He knew his job. He knew he had to throw the weight around, and he's got a lot of it. And those are the strengths of his game, as I said, battling along the boards, checking guys into the boards, checking them off the puck, winning scrums. Those are the things that Drew Jarkera does well, and he did that well again for the Blackhawks this season. I really would have liked to see where that number would have been had he been able to play a full 82-game season. And in terms of the analytics, basically on par with what we've seen from most of the fourth liners. Uh, this one's pretty similar to Reese Johnson, I would say. Kara's Corsi percentage was 38.4%. Again, when he's not chipping in literally anything offensively, zero assists and three goals, the fourth line as a whole really didn't have that much success in terms of puck in the back of the net. Uh, that's probably right on point for what you would expect it to be. Uh, but one thing that was interesting too, Kara was only on the ice for five goals for at five on five this year basically the same thing as Reese Johnson. They just did not chip in whatsoever, really. But he was only on the ice for 16 goals against. And that fourth line, uh, they were playing against a lot of the top forwards and were given tough jobs to do. So kind of like Reese Johnson. I mean, the offense wasn't there, but the defense, it was. So um, now if they could chip in a little bit more, I think that would be a huge swing for the Blackhawks' bottom six. And we'll see where Kara fits in that picture, though, because. I talked about this with Reese Johnson season recap. They've signed him, Mackenzie Ann Whistle, and Boris Kachuk to contract extensions. Where does Drew Jarkera fit in that mix? Would they rather give ice time in the bottom six to younger guys? Probably. So it's going to be interesting to see how that affects Drew Jarkera and his role. And even if he's with the Blackhawks moving forward, but um, he has shown that he's capable of being a solid defensive minded player and can never have too many of those guys, whether they're NHL tweeners or in the lineup night in and night out. Uh, so we'll see what Jujar Kara's role is, but I believe the coaching staff in the front office is well aware of what he's able to do defensively and in terms of his hits. So all in all, taking everything and taking everything into consideration, uh, I mentioned, I'm not going to be too harsh on Jujar Kara. The offense obviously wasn't great. Uh, but it was kind of tough to depict exactly what kind of role and what kind of season he was going to have because he was really only playing when the Blackhawks were horrendous earlier on in the season. So uh, taking everything into consideration, a, a big role, good faceoff percentage, good physicality, strong defensively, just provided literally nothing on offense. I'm just going to give Jujar Kara a flat C for his performance this season. I think we would have expected more, but also at the same time, he kind of slipped slipped through the cracks and had himself a sound defensive season. So I think a flat C is pretty fair for what Jujar Kara put together this year. I wish him all the best. Hopefully he'll be able to get back on the ice and help this Blackhawks team more than he did um, in his first year in Chicago. All right, folks, I think that is going to wrap up 
Thursday, July 7th episode of Locked On Blackhawks. Thank you all again for tuning into the show and be sure to go and follow Locked On Blackhawks right now, wherever you get your podcast and go and subscribe to Locked On Blackhawks on YouTube and you'll be able to get the latest episode as soon as it comes out each day. And after the show, be sure real quick to go and check out the Locked On NHL podcast for all the latest news, info, and updates ahead of the first round of the NHL draft later this evening. It's free and available on all platforms, so be sure to go and check out Locked On NHL right now, wherever you get your podcasts. Once again, thank you for tuning into today's episode. I'm your host, Jack Bushman. You can find me out on Twitter at Jack Bushman 2 or you could also go and check out my Strictly Blackhawks account at Talk and Hockey for all the latest Blackhawks news and updates. And for any questions at all regarding anything related to the show or to the Blackhawks, feel free to email lockdownblackhawks at gmail.com. You could also hit me up on any one of my Twitter accounts, or you could call 708 653 0572 to leave a voicemail. So until tomorrow's episode, thanks again. For tuning into the Lockdown Blackhawks podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day.